So whenever I start out a plate, I am going to prep my wheel just like I would with anything. My students at my school, we have a, a bat mates which go underneath their bats. This is great if you've never used it. It's designed to kind of keep the bat a little bit more snug so it doesn't move. These uh, plastic bats, like what I'm using, the Amico ones, they, these are very, very old and the holes sometimes start to enlarge over the years of use and uh, the bat mate helps to keep it from jiggling around. Now, I am going to be throwing four pound plates, but uh, this first technique that I'm going to show you is what I show my students, and that is centering uh, the four pounds from two separate two pound balls. Uh, my students, as they are beginning to do uh, plates, they haven't done much that's been very large. So far in my class, they've done uh, like one and a half pound cups, two pound bowls, and they did do a four pound bowl. So this will be their their next time for doing uh, a four pound hunk. So I am going to go ahead and center the first initial lump. Now, as I tell my kids, it's all about centering where it meets the bat. If you are off center where it meets the bat, like if it's if it's off center, but then you center the top up here, that won't matter at all. You have to center this bottom part because that is the most important part uh, in centering. So once I get the first hunk centered, I'm then going to rib off all of my slip that I have on it to make sure it's not going to have any slip. Go, trying to find my little rib that I wanted. Okay, so when I rib off the slip, I'm scraping it really well because I don't want to have a sheen of slip on there. If you have a sheen of slip, it's going to be the thing that keeps your balls from adhering together. So there we go. So I've got my centered hunk, remove my slip, and this is a way that. Uh, you certainly don't have to do it this way. I just like to show my kids this way if they are struggling. Okay, so I'm going to take my next tunk, put it right on top, blend, making sure that I, again, there was no water, no slip on the bottom of the new hunk or on the top of the old hunk. Okay, so now that I have that sealed to it, now I can go ahead and center this bit into the old one. In the next one, I'll show it without doing the, uh, the, the two two-pound hunks. Now, what I always tell the kids is try to keep the top of it domed. So, like right here, see how this is starting to create a well? That's what you want to be aware of to avoid. So by just positioning your hand position to kind of create almost a diagonal pressure right there, it will help to bring the top part up to prevent a well. And it, this is already pretty centered. I just wanted to go ahead and show you this. So for my kids, when they're learning to center four pound hunks, I usually tell them do the exact same process that you did with the smaller hunks, like cone it a few times, to make sure that you are absolutely centered. Okay, so there we go. And I'm going to just bring this back down. Okay, now for doing a plate, we want to think about what is the form of the plate that we're going to make. Are we going to make it totally flat on the bottom? Are we going to make it scooped? So I'm going to show you two different styles of plates here. This first one is going to be a scooped one. Now I am going to go ahead and lower this more, keeping it centered. Again, look at where it meets the bat. I want to make sure that it is centered down here. And then 
So it's much wider than a regular hockey puck. Now I'm going to take the heel of my hand. I'm going to push this in a little bit more. Instead of flattening it all the same, this one is going to be scooped, right? So as I push it outward, I'm going to allow it to raise. So this is creating more of a, whoop, a gentle scoop. Now, the feet on plates don't necessarily have to be, um, they don't have to be trimmed, but for my students, my requirement is that they need to turn in a, a plate that has a trimmed foot, because I want them to understand it. But certainly, it's possible to make plates without trimmed feet. Okay. So now I have a scooped interior, and now I'm going to take this rim, okay, that I have out here, just going to go back in there, scoop it a little bit more, um, and actually before I do the rim, I'll show you a really nice tool that you can use would be like a platter rib, or a plate rib, you can call it whichever you want, I don't remember, this is a mud tools rib. If you look on the Mud Tools website, you'll see uh, what they call it. Again, I'm not 100% sure, but this just helps to do a nice little compression there. And now I'm going to take this scooped rim that I have, and I'm just going to bring this up and out a little bit more. So this is a style of a plate. Again, there are so many different ways. Just look at different imagery. Uh, when I introduce the plate project to my kids, I show them a ton of different plate styles. There we go. Now, again, I could use this here at the end just to get it really, really smoothed out. Now, think about what do you want with the, uh, the rim? Do you want it to be a real flat rim like this, or do I want to raise it up? So if I want to raise it up a little bit, I'm going to just create a little bit more of a kind of a scoop there on this rim, making sure that I have water on both of my sides of the wall when I go to do that. Now one of the things that I always tell my kids is try to avoid any horizontal sort of angle on a rim because if you have a horizontal angle, um, one of the things that I tell my kids is avoid horizontal angles on rims because if you have anything that is fully horizontal, it'll probably collapse. So always have an up sweep, an uplift to this. All right, now one of the key things in cutting a plate or a platter is making sure that you don't allow the wire to ride up at all. If that wire rides up, you will have a bottom that might get too thin. So as I do this, I'm pressing hard against the bat as I pull across. Please cut it on the day that you throw it because if you try to come back the next day, it's going to be very difficult. Now, uh, it is possible to throw on bats where you don't have to cut it. If you have a very absorbent bat, oh, I just dinged it. I wasn't, wasn't watching. If you have a very absorbent bat, like made of plaster or made of wood, it's possible to get away without cutting it. But for my students, 
you have to cut the ones that are on these plastic bags. Um, I'll do one, one final thing too before I take it off. I'm going to just use my chamois since I just dinged the rim there on accident. There we go. So wet chamois will help to compress and smooth the rim. So there we go. That is a, a, a scooped plate, I'll call that. Now the second style of plate that I'm going to make here, this is just going to be an absolutely flat bottom. And instead of doing this out of two separate pieces, I'm just using one four pound hunk. Okay, I just want to make sure that I don't have any uh, gaps in there. Now if you ever are concerned about S cracking, one of the things just do it on this one to show you. So the spiral was going like this on my ball, but I'm actually going to take this, form it into a slightly different shape ball, and I'm going to put it so the spiral is actually going sideways on this. Now, why would I do that? If the clay is maybe a little bit on the drier side and it didn't meld super well together when you were doing uh, your wedging, you could end up with a uh, a spot where perhaps it starts to delaminate, uh, which is not good. And by rotating it like this, it I think it will help to prevent that. Okay, so again, I'm going to focus on centering it down here at the bottom. I am taking my thumbs up here to keep it domed at the top, but it's the pinky down there where it meets the bat, that's the important part. Now, once I have it fairly centered down there at the bottom, I allow my pressure points to just go up, and then as I push it down again, I'm gonna keep it domed. So, and the trick that I usually give when you're coning, when you push it down, if you push it slightly away from you and down, it helps. So, here I go, I'm gonna center this, cone it again, and when your pressure points are directly opposite of each other and you bring your hands up, it helps to bring the off-centeredness right up through the tip on the clay. I'll move this over here so I'm not reaching in front of that. Okay, and then again, focused right down there at the bat. Bring those pressure points dead across from one another so the off-centeredness comes all the way up to the very tip of the clay. Now, I'll, I'll go sideways here so you can see this. So again, as I center this, I push down and away. And that looks pretty, pretty centered. If you are using a large piece of clay and you have really firm clay, you might want to uh, soften it. You could look at I've got lots of videos on how you can rehydrate clay and it might make it a little bit easier, but you, I, you obviously you don't want it too soft, but you also you don't want it too firm because that can be very uh, difficult, especially for a beginner student. Now, for this one, it's going to be a flat bottom and I'm going to be dropping the disc all the way to the final thickness that I want the, um, the, the top of the plate, okay? And I am going to allow it uh, thickness to trim a foot on it. Now, normally what I would do is I would just show kids how you can just take your arm like this and you kind of, you're going back and forth to drop it down and you're pushing really hard, right? That is a normal technique. But there is another way that I wanna show that uh, I'm showing my students. This makes centering a flat one really easy. This is a large dowel rod that I just got at the hardware store in the uh, like the trim section. Okay, now with water on it, I'm gonna take hands on both sides and I'm pushing down this already centered piece of clay. Now, it loses its water, so I'm just gonna add more water. And again, I'm pushing it down until I get to that final thickness that I need the top of the plate. So I'm gonna go down to just a little bit above half an inch, maybe five eighths of an inch, something like that. 
So that will be the final thickness of my plate. Now, let me grab my sponge again and let's talk about the rim here. So let's hypothetically say you drop it and you've, you've gotten it off somehow. Maybe your clay wasn't fully centered. Usually just a little compression there with the rim, with the sponge, can take care of it. But there's a, a nice little cheat that I show my beginner students that they find it very handy sometimes. So if you have dropped it this far and it's a little off on the edge, you can take a wooden knife. Now, my advice to them is always use two hands, lock your elbows, you're using both hands to hold it firmly, and you can just come down and drop it right along the edge. And now you have cut off any of the off-centered bits of clay that you had when you dropped it. So we'll just remove this. This will all get recycled. So now this is a perfectly centered hunk of clay. Now I'm, I'm going to take my sponge and go in there and I'm just going to compress it. Now this is just a big old flat disc at this point. So to make it into a plate, I'm going to take my thumb and I'm going to be pushing in. Now the fleshy part of my thumb goes down against the bat. My nail goes up against the clay. Notice how I am holding it with my opposite hand as well. So I do that and I push up the amount of the rim that I want to come up. Now, you might want a bigger rim or a smaller rim. It's going to be up to your, your choice, but then I'm just going to come in here and compress this rim, and then I want to think about what is the form that I want to my rim. And again, maybe you want to use like a rib to help define that. So like right in here, maybe I want a, like a nice little rounded rim, okay? This is a flat bottom with a rounded rim. And this one definitely has a corner. It's different than the scooped one because the scooped one was a smooth transition. This one is a flat bottom with the rim. And if you wanted to do, again, like a little flange to the top edge, I am going to add a little water, making sure that it's wet on both sides. And then I'm just going to take my rib and kind of define that edge. So now I have a little bit of a flat rim. And remember that you always need remember that you always need support under a rim. So it, the larger the larger the flare it is, you need to have more support under it so it doesn't collapse. This was just super small. It's more or less just a compression of, of that edge there. And lastly, once again, I'll use my chamois. And if you're making stacking plates, if you're making a set of plates, you always want to be aware to make sure, number one, it's the same uh, uh, volume of clay that you're it's the same uh, weight of clay that you're opening it to the same width um, that your your profile of the rim looks identical on all of them you don't want to have some with thick rims and thun, some with thin rims so you want to be attentive to all those things so there we go now plates typically take 48 hours in a damp cabinet to get leather hard um, if you're leaving it fully uncovered, you might want to check it after maybe, you know, f four or so hours. What you want to do is allow it to dry pretty evenly. So if the rim is drying out too quickly, you could end up with um, an uneven drying, which could result in some cracks. So you want it to dry evenly. Once the rim gets stiff enough, I usually like to take it off and flip it. Now, when I flip it and it's still flexible, you don't want to just pick it up and manhandle it. You want to put a bat on it and then flip it so you can uncover the bottom so it's on the rim. So just be careful, uh, again, not to manhandle it when it's uh, soft. Um, for my students, leave it on the bats when you put it in the class cabinets. Do not try to remove it like we sometimes do with the bowls and the cups and stuff. And we'll talk about trimming later.